So I'm back in the office with the full noise of the city in the background. Our readings today, when read on face value, make living a life of peace without conflict look so super easy. In Romans, we're simply told, love one another, love your neighbour as yourself. The commandments are summed up. And then we get the eschatological feel of verses 11 to 14, where it really sounds like a call to hurry up and sort yourselves out. Then we've got the Gospel reading. And what seems to be a very simple formula for resolving, or at least dealing with conflict in community. Speak one-on-one. -on -one. If that doesn't work, take one or two others. And if it still doesn't work, let them be as a Gentile and a tax collector. So a quick note about, note about the broader context. If we read the beginning and the end of Matthew chapter 17, we can see that today's reading is actually set in the context of a public dispute. And the issue being temple tax, and more generally, the authority of the kings of the earth. Well, likewise, Paul's broader concern is taxes and revenues that were demanded by Rome. So just lock that away for a moment. In Romans, Paul manages to mention the word love no less than five times within three verses. Now in the Greek, there are four words for love. We only have one. The word used by Paul is agape, which is the unconditional God love. These verses are the final instruction on agape, rounding off what began way back in chapter 12, verse 9. The whole of chapters 12 and 13 are for the benefit of the Christ movement in Rome. They're a guide to the identity characteristics that followers need to hold on to and manifest. The Gospel reading. While it may appear as a simple formula and an opportunity to banish people, and I've seen it used for exactly that purpose, this passage is actually about restoration and reconciliation. It presents us with an alternative to the dominant criminal justice system, one that favoured those with power and wealth of the first century CE and beyond. We're being introduced to a system of non-violent peacemaking. Often, peacemaking and peacekeeping are confused. As people of Easter faith, we're often tempted to aim for nice which leads us to the path of peacekeeping. Yet peacekeeping is vastly different to peacemaking. Peacemaking doesn't occur by avoiding conflict. Quite the opposite. It addresses the conflict. Peacemakers must sometimes first be peace disturbers. The reality is there is a need to enter a space where we would rather not tread. Jesus, in this passage, is establishing an alternative governance, one that reflects his life and teachings, which consisted of non-violence, endurance without retaliation, restoring the lost sheep to the fold, to be the prophetic voice of truth, to love neighbours, and more challengingly, to love enemies. Jesus' approach is one that calls people to avoid coming up with hasty conclusions. It's an approach that seeks to heal rather than punish. He's expressing that when implemented well, this process is empowering and is ultimately for the purpose of restoration, not retribution. This approach displays a very human process that attempts to avoid embarrassing people looking for a way to rebuke in the most gentlest of ways. We're all human. And the reality is that conflict, brokenness, violence and indifference are all part and parcel of the messy human existence. It's often much easier to engage in hurtful words and actions, to admit, justify and attack all in one breath. Conflict is often seen as an opportunity to get our own back, to seek revenge. It has the potential 
to destroy individuals, communities, and on a grander scale, nations. Yet Jesus is saying, no, that's not the way. When Jesus says, if the offender refuses to listen, even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and tax collector, it's quite easy to hear the exclusion and punishment. Reality is, we have to remember that Jesus is accused of being a friend to tax collectors and sinners. He took time to sit and eat with them. The exclusion becomes a sacred space, an opportunity to reflect, to re-establish relationships, to reach out and to hear the good news anew. The exclusion space in the reconciliation process is a time of discovery. Reconciliation doesn't always mean a return to community, but a moving on. We are at present with the upside down, sorry, we are presented with the upside down kingdom, with restoration and reconciliation being action, praxis and movement. Reconciliation is not merely a negotiated compromise, it goes far beyond that. When we speak of reconciliation, how it's understood or viewed will be dependent upon the who, the experience, the social location, the perception of past, the who is being addressed, and the reason for speaking. Grunchy goes on in his book to ask questions such as, whose reconciliation is at stake? What's the purpose? Whose terms? Are we speaking from a position of power or weakness? So many questions, and it's at this point we realize the landscape of reconciliation is a complex landscape indeed. Let's consider the call to reconcile with Aboriginal people. So many people opposed to saying sorry, opposed to listening, so many refusing to engage and accept the past. And the result is that conflict and unrest simmers under the surface. Yet there can be no denial of the fact of the history because it's one of death and destruction. A more positive example of reconciliation is the work of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission at the end of apartheid. In this, the pain and destruction of the past had to be heard. The exclusion acknowledged and the willingness to move to embrace. Reconciliation never means going back. It's always about moving forward. To take it back to the context in the readings, in Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, we had if you're angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn also the other. Jesus was always teaching an alternative way of living. For Paul, he wasn't afraid of Rome killing or enacting violence upon Christians. Quite the contrary. He was most afraid that Christians would respond violently. The alternative life to which disciples were called and to which we are called requires new loyalties and allegiance. We cannot first associate with our culture of heritage or origin of birth. In responding to the call to discipleship, we are first and foremost people of Easter faith. We're called, called to live an alternative way. Paul was calling the people of the Christ movement to emphasize the difference between the peace of Rome and the peace of Christ. So too, we must emphasize the difference between the peace of the world and the peace of Christ. It is through Christ that we are reconciled with God and one another, and that occurs only through love. And so I finish with a quote from Martin Luther King Jr from strength to love. Love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. We never get rid of an enemy by meeting hate with hate. 
We get rid of an enemy by getting rid of enmity. By its very nature, hate destroys and tears down. By its very nature, love creates and builds up. Love transforms with redemptive.